Welcome to the Breaking 90 podcast, where we talk about all things sustainable fat loss. We take people on 90-day journeys to creating fat loss forever. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Breaking 90 podcast. I'm here today with my co-host, Kelly Sarlo, and we are the coaches of Breaking 90 Fitness. Thank you guys for being here and listening. I hope you enjoy this episode. What's going on? Hey, Kelly. What's going on? Snow is going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, snow is funny because I grew up loving snow. Uh, I would like, I think most kids love snow and I skied a lot growing up. So I spent most of my winter outside. Um, then as I got a little bit older and got away from, I still enjoy to go skiing. I love it. Um, but I don't do it nearly as much. I used to do it like every single day. So now the fact that skiing a couple times of a year is my enjoyment that comes with winter I started to like kind of resent winter as a result which I think a lot of adults do um but now I've got a son who's five who loves winter (laughs) because it's it's so friggin' fun for kids like there's so much to do in the snow as a kid and it it brings me back to that feeling but it's it also like it's also like okay Alex like don't visibly like show your disgust for winter because you don't want that to rub off on a kid who loves it out there and then once you get out there and you start doing these things you start hiking and building snow forts and like having fun when you shovel you're like oh yeah winter actually is really fun (laughs) And especially as a child, your only responsibility in the snow is to play in it. As an adult, you walk out and you're like, my responsibility is to move it. Yeah. Yeah. And moving it sucks when you're alone. But now that he's like old enough to get in his gear and come out there and like, he's throwing snowballs at me while I'm moving it. (laughs) And like, I'm throwing snow shovel loads at him. It's like, oh, okay. Like, it is fun, actually. Yeah, snow awesome. snow is a lot of fun it just sucks when you don't make it fun <laughs> yeah. obviously there's different challenges but I, I love how I'm like rediscovering a bit of a passion for winter yeah that's lovely what do you got for us today uh I don't really know what I want to call this episode but I wanted to ask you because we've, we've got quite a few members right now in our breaking 90 program who are experiencing different injuries I thought it would be beneficial to ask how not not because of us. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Um, I wanted to ask, like, how do you suggest people go through an assessment process of their own body and capabilities, assessing for their injuries in order to adjust their expectations of themselves? Okay. First of all. Can I just like go off a little bit on the beginning of this? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm really interested in the topic myself, just from a mindset perspective. Um, But I want to know what your check-in process is. So yes, go off in any way that you see. So this is off topic a little bit. Okay. Injuries are going to happen in our life. We can be unhealthy and potentially overweight and have nagging chronic pain or we can be healthy and in a healthy body composition and probably are going to encounter the occasional injury you don't have to I'm not saying this is for sure and I don't encourage people to push themselves to the point of injury but inevitably if you're exercising regularly you're probably going to encounter more injuries along the way than if you're not That being said, these injuries that we encounter are going to cause a lot less long-term grief than being out of shape and not taking care of our health. Those nagging chronic problems are going to be a much, much bigger problem for you, especially as you age. Um, Do you have anything you want to ask there? Does that make sense? No, I love that you're setting the stage for basically to understand who's kind of predisposed to (laughs) these circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I think given the two options, everybody's going to choose getting in better shape with the chance of some injuries along the way. Right. right? Um, we, unfortunately, when we choose a life of activity, are running a risk. <laughs> We're running a risk that we're going to be exposed to more injuries. So bring me back, bring me back to your initial question. So how do I check in? So I, you know, I experience a muscle strain or I experience, um, you know, a twisted ankle or something like that. And I'm, I need to check in with myself and assess my capabilities. What are the kinds of questions that you go through? What kind of check-ins do you do with your body to, to make that assessment possible? Cool. I think first of all, if you're ever really in doubt, seek a professional. I think that's so important. And I, and by professional, like this isn't a one size fits all. This doesn't mean go see your doctor. Your doctor might give you great advice, might refer you out to great advice. It could be, it could, depending on the type of injury, it could be talking to your coach or your trainer. It could be going to see physio, chiro, osteo, it could be any of those. And, and the truth is the, the more current physios, massage therapists, chiros, osteos, the ones who are really staying on top of things are now just kind of blending all of their services anyways. It's like the more recent we're realizing that it's not like, it used to be a very strong battle like chiro versus physio. And now the ones who are staying current are like, ah, no, I kind of see why they did that. And I see why they did that. And they, everybody does a little bit of everything. So that old school, that old school mentality, that old school thought, we don't see as much of it, especially if you're working with a doctor that stays current on those, which I like. So um, usually seeing any one of those who's, who's really good at their job is going to give you a really reasonable solution. Um, look at me getting off topic again. No, hey, putting a health team together is a great way to start knowing where where to yeah. assess yourself. Yeah, and and I know for a lot of people that don't have benefits, that can be a bit of a pain because you can see your doctor for free, um, but you can't necessarily see a physio or chiro for free. It's worth it. <laughs> it's if if you're at all in doubt of where you're at and you're you're not clear on your your action plans moving forward, it's worth the investment. It's going to save you a lot of long term grief. If it's not to that point where you're unsure, I mean, you listen to your body. That's that's the best advice I can give. There is listen to your body, and that that can be hard to do for a lot of people because listening to our bodies is is part of the problem we're here. <laughs> um, but if your body is telling you probably don't squat on this leg today, this leg isn't feeling good. It's not going to matter if you squat today. <laughs> okay. Like I'm not, I'm not telling you to sit on your ass and be lazy, but like maybe today we just go for a walk or a bike ride or we do an upper body workout because my leg kind of doesn't feel right. Um, that's not going to change your long-term progress at all. <laughs> And then you can revisit that squat in two, three, four or a week. And that's fine. You're not going to lose, you're not going to lose progress in anything by doing that. And you're, you're actually going to push yourself further ahead because pushing through an injury is just going to make the injury worse. And then it'll, it'll increase the amount of downtime we need as a result. Um, so I love, I love people just being in tune with what their body is telling them. Um, Go ahead. I'll, I'll write down a note of where I want to go next. I just wanted to add to that because though you're saying it and I can say it makes sense, I think it's a very big cliche for a lot of people where they have no idea what that means, right? They don't know how to check in with different systems. They don't know how to check in with different muscles. They just tell their body what to do and are in defiance of listening back. Um, and one of, one of the best pieces of advice that I was, or I received was from a yoga instructor who said, I, I was getting into a different, um, asana or posture and they said, what are you feeling? What are you experiencing right now? And I was like, oh, it hurts a bit. And they're like, is it pain or is it discomfort? And I was like, oh, interesting. And, and the distinction between the two obviously is subjective. Um, but they specifically said, if you're feeling pain, stop pull back to 80%. 
which was great because I, I can kind of picture if I'm stretching to 100, what would 80% look like to pull back from? And then if it's just discomfort, you're probably in a stretch that is asking your muscles to do a little more than, than they're used to, and that's okay. So yeah. I, I throw pain versus discomfort into my assessment for injury, especially if I'm trying to get back to something that I used to be able to do before. Love that. There's there's a difference between pain, discomfort, and muscle soreness and yeah. muscle fatigue. Yeah. So so yeah. one thing I hear often from people is like, holy shit, I'm sore from my workout today. It's very unlikely you're sore from your workout today. If you are, you may have an injury because we should have muscle fatigue. We should be tired. Our legs might be failing us trying to walk upstairs because they're freaking tired but you're probably not sore yet the muscle soreness usually the delayed onset muscle soreness usually comes 24 to 48 hours later and that's an okay soreness we don't more soreness doesn't equal more progress either first of all if you're listening to this you don't need to shoot for soreness if you're not getting sore that's not a bad thing if you are getting sore that's not a bad thing but we're going to get these DOMS, these delayed onset muscle soreness, really aggressively the first couple of weeks we get back into doing something. You have two options here. You push through or you don't go at it as aggressively. You start off softer, you start off lighter, you let your body adapt slowly and you keep moving forward. Um, neither is necessarily right or wrong but if you're somebody who's not really familiar with the feeling of doms and what that is versus injury start off slower <laughs> like if you start off aggressively training today versus progressively training today it's not going to slow your long-term progress unless you hit an injury your chances of injury are much higher starting aggressively cool make sense yeah love that um but yeah i like the way that your yoga instructor put it too is like discomfort is okay we have to become uncomfortable with being uncomfortable right we grow in discomfort so we have to create some level of discomfort to to ask our body to change um but we should never be shooting for pain ever oh. um I know a lot of you will be like, well, delayed onset muscle soreness is pain. Like, yeah, I get it. It's, it's, it's drawing the difference, the, the difference between good pain and negative pain. Um, but we certainly, sorry, I was just going to say, we certainly don't need extreme levels of delayed onset muscle soreness. You don't have to squat to the point you can't walk, walk tomorrow. <laughs> it's not necessary in order to grow. If you slowly build up your body to that, you won't get those levels of delayed onset muscle soreness. So it's not like it's not like you have to beat yourself in those first two, three weeks. <laughs> and this, this is where I like numbers, like the scale of, of one to 10, like, okay, so how much does it hurt? If you're experiencing pain, you're probably in the level of a 7.5 to a 10 out of mm -hmm. 10. If you're experiencing discomfort or soreness, correct me if I'm wrong, you're probably experiencing something on the lower end of that, um, where it's not crossing into um, potential for injury. Yeah, it, it depends. That that has to do with you being very aware of yourself. And if you're working with a coach, your coach being very aware of you, because I could ask three different clients where they're at on a rate of perceived exertion. Okay. And they're going to like, everybody's nine would look very different. For right? sure. And I think a lot of people mix in, and I, I can't imagine you would disagree with me as a fitness coach. A lot of people mix in when you ask, what's your pain or your discomfort level like? They mix in, do I like what I'm doing? Yeah. And it's like, well, I hated this. So it's a nine. And you're like, yeah. well, what's your body saying? Like, how is it actually responding to the activity itself? Not how much did you hate me when you had to do this? Yeah. Yeah, even so sidetrack, even as a first responder, um, responding to people and asking them how bad is your pain on a scale of one to 10. I've seen people in tens that are like talking calmly while they sit there talking to you. And I've seen people in like sevens that are on the verge of death. So like we we all have such different scales. So it, it really is important to be 
a little bit aware of your own scale when you're using that as a tool. Um, I want to circle back to something I thought of with deadlifts specifically. Deadlifts are one of the most physically taxing lifts. So it's just lifting a weight off the floor. Um, it's a, it's, it's a really compound whole body movement that I think done properly for most people is a really great lift, but it's super taxing because it's so compound. It uses a lot of muscle activation throughout our whole body, not just one specific isolated muscle, but aside from physically taxing, I would challenge it's one of the most mentally taxing lifts. The deadlift will, when we fail on a deadlift, it's almost always because we failed in our head rather than our body failing us, which, which is cool. Um, so I, 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 I had a way that I wanted to relate this back to this topic more, but I forget where I wanted to go with that. But, but it's, this is, uh, this is where, oh, I know what I wanted to say. So if you if you're pulling a weight off the floor so say say you're pulling a 300 pound deadlift off of the floor and you you get it with ease it's very common to see that same lifter fail at 305 and it's not it's not that they physically couldn't move that bar a single inch it's that they just didn't feel right they mentally blocked themselves and they they got those limiting beliefs and then all of a sudden that bar is glued to the floor regardless of what it weighs at that point is glued to the floor and it's not moving so when we talk about listening to our bodies and going into a workout we have to we have to listen to our head also i've had i have one client who lifts very aggressively she does heavy lifts often and she's getting really good at this. We've worked together for many, many years now, but she's getting really good at this, going into the gym and saying, my head is not in the right place today for this, for this specific exercise, especially something like a deadlift, because it's compound. It has a higher chance of injury if we don't do it properly. You're, with something small like a bicep curl, if you're tired, if your head's not in the game, if you don't do it properly, you're probably not going to injure yourself. But with the bigger, more compound movements, the chance of injury also goes up. So early on in a lifting career, we want to push through that. We want to challenge ourselves. I know I can lift this 300 because I did 295 last time and it wasn't that hard. I know I can do this 300. But you today isn't the exact same as you last week on this day. Your sleep has changed. Your stress has changed. Your recovery has changed. Your nutrition might have changed. There's there's too many factors to just say, well, I did it last week, so it's the same. It isn't. So we have to be very aware of our 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 headspace and our body and how we're feeling going into that. We talked about that from a physical standpoint. If if my back wasn't feeling great, of course I wouldn't push through a deadlift. But now if my head isn't right, it's the same thing. As soon as your head isn't right, your chance of injury goes way up. If I get sloppy, if I'm stressed, if I'm if I'm not focused on what I am doing, the task at hand, my injury chance goes way up. And so what we should always be doing here, I'm not telling you not to deadlift on that day, kick it back. Do 50%, do 80%, do 70%. Do a number that you know you could wake up out of bed and lift that off the floor without injuring yourself. There's still a ton of benefit to that to going through the motion, to forcing your body to go through the motion, to stay strong, that's going to, you, you're probably not going to progress that day. You're not going to get stronger as a result of that day, but it's for sure going to help you maintain and avoid regression, yeah. right? And that's like, you should only ever really be pushing yourself to the limit when you're feeling both mentally and physically in line. That doesn't mean you have to be a hundred percent. You're not always going to be a hundred percent, but like if you're, if your head is running at 50%, your body's running at 80%, you're running a risk. What, like why push yourself to the limit that day? Okay. I really like this because the, the other part of what I was asking you is how do we adjust our expectations? Because so many people, when they're injured, they want to keep doing what they were doing before. They're disappointed that they can't do what they were doing before, even though I have an injury. It's like, we feel we should be the exception to the rule, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I can power through because it's me or I should power through because I don't deserve the rest, whatever it might be. 
And you're talking about assessing your head and assessing your body and then picking a percentage of maybe the same activity, but also maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Like a- any lift I do, like I, I follow um, a powerlifting style of exercise. So basically if I'm going out to squat that day, my warm up is going to include a ton of squats. So I'm going to start off with maybe 40% of what I can lift and I'm going to slowly build up to my goal, which is going to be somewhere between 80 and hundred percent of what I can lift. That's where I want to get to for that day. So I will somewhere along the way realize that my engines aren't fire firing on all cylinders, right? Because I've done a lot of squats to get there. So that's like, for most people, I would encourage more warm up sets is your, your recipe to avoid injury, more warm up sets, spend, sacrifice some of your working exercise time, increase warm up exercise time. And in doing so now you're giving your body an opportunity to be like, Ooh, that glute doesn't really feel great. Or my back is kind of sore. And this is only at 60%. So I'm going to try 65% see if I notice the same thing, because maybe I just set up a little bit different. So I'm going to take a little break, come back to it. Now I'll go a little bit heavier. No, I'm still feeling that. Okay. Today, We're kicking it back to 60. We're going to do our working sets at 60% of what we're capable of. We'll revisit this next week or in a couple of days from now. So you're talking, am I hearing you correctly when you're saying that you're talking about how to avoid injury, but also how to come back from an injury as well? Yeah, totally. If you're coming, like, if you're coming back from an injury, I would argue that for most people, the best thing you can do is get back into what you were doing at a much, much lower intensity. I think that most people, if you have a back injury, shouldn't be avoiding deadlifts until their back's 100%. You should be coming back into deadlifts at a crazy manageable weight. Mm -hmm. Like at a weight that's so stupid easy for you that it feels foolish. Just simply get back into the motion of things. Yeah. Well, and then it's how you manage your expectations. Yeah. And like and that. sorry. Somebody brand new to weightlifting is going to notice rapid 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 changes. You're going to feel like you're getting stronger so fast when in reality you're just getting more efficient with your muscles. Oh, you're yeah. going to you're going to get better at lifting, so you're not you're not actually putting on like 20 pounds of strength between each lifting session. Um whereas once we get into what I would cons- I'd, I'd say most people are either beginner or intermediate we don't see a lot of people ever make it past intermediate unless your sole passion is weightlifting um so once you get into that intermediate say five years of serious lifting down the road you're going to be much more aware of this kind of thing so it's, it's more for these beginners who are increasing their their load by huge amounts from session to session right and yet this still applies to if you absolutely love walking absolutely love running and that's your your go-to workout Totally, totally. I mean, strength training has a high injury possibility because we're putting our body under a lot of load. We're not, we don't see nearly as many injuries in something like walking. Running, on the other hand, has a very high injury potential also. Um, and I would argue that often it's because you don't prioritize strength training for that running. Cool. We're not putting enough emphasis on training the joints and muscles to support that level of extended impact. Mm-hmm. But the same principles apply. Listen to your body, come back at a less intensity for you runners listening to this. If you're injured, you're not feel you're not there in your head or you're not there in your body. Walk that day. You're telling me you don't think walking is going to help you maintain what you've gained from running. You're only kidding yourself. Yeah. And I love, I love to, you know, just the way that you're presenting this, when you're saying that your head is not in the game, again, it's not about how much you want it right? Or how much you love it. It's, it's how present you are, how aware you are, how in control of your body you feel you are, not just I miss it and I want to do it. Yeah. Most of the time when we see somebody injure themselves in weightlifting, I keep circling back to weightlifting because it's easy for me to reference here. Most of the time when we see people injure themselves in weightlifting, it isn't on their max effort lift. Right. It's somewhere in the warm up process because their head wasn't there. They didn't lift that weight that is super easy to them with the same intention that they would lift the heavier weight. Because by the time you get to that heavier weight, you're laser focused. 
you know I need to do everything right. You see people injure themselves picking a vacuum up off the floor who are capable of lifting a 200 pound bar. I remember, because, sorry. Because their head wasn't in the game. They tell you this in driving school when you're getting your license that most accidents happen within a five kilometer radius or even a one kilometer radius of your house because you're relaxed. You've driven it a thousand times and you become less present to what you're doing. 100%. Yeah, cool. Okay. This is great. I'm so glad I asked. Good topic. Really good topic. Thanks. I want to leave people with a tip today, but I don't want to cut you off. Is there more that you wanted to cover? No, we, I mean, we could go and we could go and we, we, maybe we'll do another episode eventually, but that, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me interrupt so much out of my excitement. I apologize. <laughs> um, the tip that I want to leave people with today, uh, it's just something quick and simple. It's an exercise I often forget to do. Uh, and I'm saying it because a lot of our listeners are strapped for time uh, and that's calf raises. It's something that you can do on the phone. If your video is turned off and you're on a conference call, you can do it hanging out on your staircase. It's just such an accessible thing to do. And if you're really focusing on form, and I'm sure you can jump in here, Alex, um, really focusing on the time that you're taking to come down from the calf raise to make sure both sides are getting equal, equal weight. Um, and also form, right? That you're not turning turning your heels inward or outward is just something that can really, um, well, really benefit you if you're if you're paying good attention to it. The one I would tag to that is walking okay. while, you, while you're on the phone. We sit so much. If you have the opportunity to walk while you're on a phone call, I'll just walk circles in my kitchen if I'm talking on the phone. It's so much better for you than always sitting. Cool. <laughs> I love that. Good tip. Okay, guys, thanks for listening. Hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, shoot us a message. Um, if, you're, if you ever have a topic you're curious and learning more about, let us know so we can do a whole episode about it. But we appreciate you being here. Make sure you share this episode with a friend if you found it useful and you think they could too.